Again, ladies and gentlemen, it is time for our next session, Case Studies 2. If you are not attending Case Studies 2, we do ask you to uh, leave the room so we can uh, have our next folks enjoy their meeting. Hi, welcome to our session. Uh, uh, my name is uh, Christoph. I'm co-founder of Scale-Up Technologies. Um, this is Frank. Uh, he's our CEO at Scale-Up Technologies, running our OpenStack cloud. Um, to give you a brief introduction who we are uh, and what we are going to talk about, we are a small sales provider based in Germany. Um, started in 1998, so a long, long time ago. Um, actually doing regular web hosting. Uh, so in 98, at least in Germany, you still had to explain your customer what a domain name is, that they should get one for themselves. Uh, and that's basically how we started. Um, uh, our business evolved over the years. Um, we are headquartered in Hamburg, in the north of Germany. And today we have four data center facilities in Germany, two in Hamburg, two in Berlin. Um, and we mainly do uh, dedicated servers, co-location, uh, virtual servers, and nowadays also cloud. So to go back a few years, uh, back in 2009, um, we had more and more small companies uh, and startup companies approach us. Uh, interested in our services, but we always had the challenge that those small companies didn't have the budget of an enterprise. Uh, they all had grand plans. They wanted to have millions of users on their portal, online shop, whatever it was, but they didn't have the money to start out. So we were uh, actually, uh, back in 2009, researching for solutions, how to, um, well, get more flexible offering our services to the customers. So in 2009, the term cloud wasn't really there yet. Um, most people called it utility computing. Um, and uh, we did um, uh, actually stumble upon a small startup based out in Southern California. It was called uh, Three Terra, and their solution was called AppLogic. Um, it was maybe, uh, at least that's what I, I, I think. It was uh, maybe the first true cloud platform out there in the market back then. Um, it was based on Zen as a virtualization layer uh, and actually had like all kinds of open source tools under, hood, under the hood. However, it was a commercial solution. So we um, did some evaluation of that software, did try it out. Um, actually decided to go forward with th this solution back then. Um, what was really cool about that, um, it had like a video-like uh, graphical user interface where you could graphically, as you do in Visio, in Microsoft Visio, um, arrange an, uh, a server infrastructure on the screen, connect all the, I don't know, the web with the database layer, uh, put up a firewall, a load balancer in front, um, save it, and it would actually spin up uh, on the Zen virtualization. So it was pretty cool stuff back then, uh, and we had lots of customers using this. However, as, uh, as things always go, uh, that company got acquired by CA Technologies, I think it was in 2010 or 11, um, and ever since, uh, it didn't really gain the traction that we uh, thought of it gaining. Um, and was eventually discontinued in 2015, last year, summer of last year. Um, another thing um, which we did uh, back in the days, um, as we were using AppLogic as our cloud platform, um, 
it did not really have a multi-tenant interface for our customers. So we figured there was nothing out there. We built it ourselves. So we actually started another data company um, back in Germany uh, doing software development. Uh, they developed a web-based portal uh, for AppLogic. Um, at that company, we also built in basic support for OpenStack. This, this was, we started doing that in 2000. Uh, 10 and actually had the first uh, small proof of concept ready at the beginning of 2011. Um, we did try to market the software, it did not work out um, because there was just not enough traction for the AppLogic platform and OpenStack uh, as a support in the software really was only a, a proof of concept at that point. Um, so uh, to now come back to uh, uh, OpenStack and what we are doing with OpenStack. Um, uh, back in 2011, when we, had, uh, when we were working with AppLogic, uh, we also uh, were looking for ways to offer a cloud storage solution uh, to our customers. So as we had lots of startup uh, uh, companies as customers, um, they were all using Amazon's S3, and we were uh, looking for ways to, to offer something similar. Um, initially, we selected a commercial uh, solution for that. Um, we uh, actually uh, also built the storage nodes ourselves. I, I've included a link here. If anyone knows the company Backblaze, they're also a US-based company. So they actually uh, open sourced the design of their storage servers. Um, uh, pretty cool stuff back then. Uh, so we actually got those uh, we ordered those chassis uh, from a company in Canada who manufactured them and actually built out the servers ourselves. Uh, however, we were running into uh, major issues, uh, getting the whole infrastructure into production. Um, it turned out it was only the firmware of the hard drives we were using. I will not name the vendor. You can ask me afterwards if you want to know, but I will not name it now. Um, it, it took like uh, over half a year for them to figure out that there was something wrong with the uh, hard disks uh, firmware. Um, so we actually stopped the whole project, um, canceled all the contracts, and uh, in 2012, when uh, the firmware was fixed for the drives, we actually uh, uh, restarted the whole project based on OpenStack Swift. So um, leading, leading, leading to OpenStack, uh, reasons why we did use OpenStack. So as I said, we did use two commercial solutions before. Um, and uh, we decided to this time do it differently. Um, I mean, we run like 99% of all our servers are pure Linux and Unix. Uh, so open source is kind of uh, uh, in our heritage and we, we do all use all kinds of open source. Um, so that's why we decided to, to go with OpenStack. Another reason, um, you can read the code yourself. You can, you can, you can debug um, uh, things yourself easily. Um, there's a great community out there. I mean, a few years ago, I, I was like on the second or third summit back in Santa Clara. It was much smaller back then. But even then, there was a large community, um, which is true for open source in general. Uh, so this is another reason why we uh, did go uh, this path. And uh, there was a proven track record, at least for, for OpenStack Swift. So like uh, four years ago, um, there were still lots of issues with Nova, but uh, Swift uh, worked pretty well from, from the beginning. So um, I will hand over to Frank. As I yeah. said, he's, he's running our OpenStack infrastructure, and he will go into more details um, how we did uh, set it up and, and what we're doing there. So, Frank. Yeah. Okay, first of all, I'd like to uh, point out one yeah, major thing. This uh, uh, is, is aimed not to, to do any, any buzz or any, 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 any flameware on uh, um, um, existing soft or big companies who are contributing a big deal to the, to the community, but this is uh, to show that there's a way for medium-sized uh, medium uh, companies to have their open stack environment running to do it their own way. And it's, uh, I, I try to figure out how it's possible to find your very own way, very much 
uh, to a high level customized environment um, and uh, yeah it's working and, and you, you, you don't need uh, to have the big numbers of servers you don't need to have uh, the big money to invest in advance to, to, to play the game you know like we have uh, uh, yeah quite some years of experience with, with cloud computing, with AppLogic before. We still have uh, customers running private cloud with AppLogic in our data centers and they're having a hard time to, to migrate over to, to the new stuff. But uh, so, yeah, what, what I want to tell you is it's, I, I don't want, want to say nothing uh, bad or evil about all this uh, uh, licensed software or um, uh, packages you, you, can, you can have. When we started with Swift, we started with DevStack, Dev and uh, yeah, that was the first time we ran into problems. So. Yeah, the direction. Uh, okay. So our in intention was to have a scalable cloud storage solution. Um, yeah, we were there. Was wrong. Andere Richtung. Huh? Is this falsch rum? Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, first setup was um, w with DevStack, as I said, and we ran into the first problems. In, the, in, in those days, Keystone was not supporting so many uh, um, auth modules. And, uh, but to, be, uh, uh, to, to, to open the API for, for a lot of different clients, like a S3 client, for example, or Cyberduck, uh, stuff like this, you, we needed, we needed a, a new version of Keystone. So uh, uh, pretty early, pretty, pretty, uh, we started to, to just uh, install uh, Ubuntu servers and uh, have uh, um, the, the <coughs> cloud repository opened on it. And, and, and we did a lot with pip install and, and stuff like this because uh, the out of the, the first attempt to, to use an out of the box uh, uh, package software, and, and yeah, it didn't work out for us. Uh, the first attempt was uh, the, the guy working for us in those days, he uh, was a big fan of uh, um, what's the name of it? Proxmox. Huh? Proxy? Proxmox. Uh, Proxmox. Maybe you know this, this, this soft, this is. Uh, Virtualization software as well was KVM and DRBD, and we had two uh, big Proxmox servers, and uh, well, had a lot of pros. Was reliable, was proven soft. It was we had a, a web UI for it, UI for it, and uh, but um, yeah, we ran into problems with this uh, um, solution as well. Because the major problem with uh, um, virtualization on this level, on the basement of, of a cloud, is that uh, you will not, um, you will not have. Uh, it, it's not possible to, to perform that high uh, uh, through bandwidth through uh, virtualized interfaces. And if you use the onboard interfaces on a, uh, a dedicated server, and and, and you, you you have many. V nodes running, uh, yeah, to connect via the, those NICs, you will, you will get into problem, especially uh, when it comes to high workloads like uh, you have on, on the low balance side where all the packages go through. <coughs> there is a study by HA Proxy what virtual, virtualization costs in, uh, uh, um, regarding the, the NICs and uh, the best. Virtualization, there was, I think this is study is this two or three years ago, it was up to 70%. They have new drivers now. It will be higher levels now, but it's still, you lose, you lose a lot by virtualizing uh, things like that. <coughs> okay. So. So what we started first was uh, just take the uh, local answer in front of the Swift clus uh, cluster uh, and put it on dedicated servers. We use HA proxy. We use HA proxy a lot uh, as a pro um, reverse proxy in front of, of the Swift proxies um, for several reasons. It's a very uh, performant soft. It has got good community as well, and uh, you can uh, easily uh, 
configure HA setups with, with HA proxy. You can do this with by, by causing pacemaker, you can do this with UCAP, whatever. Um, the other thing was uh, since I think version 1.5 HA proxy supports SSL termination, so this was w what we needed as well. And um, um, you can have uh, session uh, uh, session caching over over the two devices with MAM cached, and uh, so any any failover is seamlessly. You don't have any 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 packet losses or anything. Um, this is. Uh, this was ideal for our solution. Um, well, nonetheless, the Swift proxy still uh, uh, stayed on, on the Proxmox cluster, and we had a keystone on the Proxmox cluster as well. We, on the Proxmox, Proxmox cluster in those days uh, was holding um, um, Swift, MySQL, Mongo database, Keystone and Silometer, and this was pretty much. And uh, but w and this, on the same time, we decided that we will not only have the cloud storage, but enlarge our environment and, and build our own uh, open stack cluster. And uh, so we left this old Keystone and, and uh, this old environment until we were able to move over and to integrate the whole thing into the big open stack cluster we've built it afterwards. So, so first first attempt we had was uh, with uh, well, I have to explain one thing over there in in, in Germany and Europe uh, you have a big community using Debian and, and and Ubuntu. I know over here in the states it's more and more uh, Red Hat and and CentOS. So we decided to use Ubuntu. We decided to uh, have a try with Juju and Mars. I don't know if, if, if you're all uh, familiar with, with, with Juju and Mars. It's Mars is, 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 is you can, can do uh, bare metal uh, provisioning with Mars. And uh, uh, Juju is a uh, yeah, tool set where you have a lot of charms where you can have a, a out of the box open stack install and so on. It turned out that for our needs, this wasn't the uh, ideal solution because I was able to provision things, but uh, very often I had to, to, to yeah, work on it, reconfigure it. We had uh, ILO interfaces, IDRAC interfaces, and uh, different different BMCs, different different uh, yeah problems with the, with with mass in the beginning, and afterwards, as you will see later on, uh, for our Setup, which is, uh, yeah, in some ca some point, at some points, it's it's different from others. Uh, I had to to change the juju charms myself always, and uh, it took more time for a small number of servers to work on the juju charms to make it provisioning the the instances automatically than 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 just doing it by hand all on your own. So there was no use for us. As for other companies, this is idle, for sure might be the ideal solution. If they have a homogeneous uh, hardware of, of one type or maybe two types, and uh, they have big numbers, uh, they, they will want stuff like this or if from Red Hat or another company. But for a medium-sized uh, company as, as we are, this was no solution at all. OK, so we did, uh, what we did was basic Ubuntu installs. You can, and, and uh, we had this basic install as an, as an image on a PXE server, and so we, provisioning was easy like this as well. Just took one or two manual steps in between. Right. So yeah, then uh, we went to, to integrate the, the, the two environments, this is cloud storage and the open stack cl cluster. Well, in the first step, we still were using the old keystone because uh, still w w we had the new open stack installed in Juno and the, 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 the cloud storage, the Swift was still uh, a Grizzly, I think. And we could not just integrate it that, that, that easy. So uh, in, in the first step, I just had 
a client uh, just had a project and then a user in, in inside the Swift environment who was uh, uh, integrated into the Glance and did all the uh, uh, yeah, image providing and, and stuff for Glance from our cloud storage. From that very moment, we didn't need any, no, no, no local storage mirror on, on the controllers or stuff. We had, we had all this images and so on from, from the um, cloud storage. Then uh, what surprised me a lot uh, was really easy to uplift uh, Swift from Grizzly to Juno seamlessly without any interruption in, in, um, in business. And so afterwards we had this Swift Integration, yeah, like like just one part of the big OpenStack cluster. What you see here is our OpenStack cluster as we uh, developed it for our for our needs. Um, there is one design. It's not a failure, but it's not so very beautiful. We have all this object storage still coming through the management network. Um, if you expecting larger workloads, you should not do this. You should have an own network just for the image service so that uh, if many users do back backups or many, many, many uh, requests come for provisioning new images or stuff like this, you might get into trouble with your management network. Okay. Um, as you see, oh, we, have, we, have uh, we have mainly three networks, which is management network, which is the internal network, we use VLAN, and we're going to plan to uh, implement VXLAN uh, within the next months. Um, and we have an iSCSI network dedicated. Um, the reason why, why I uh, developed things like this was that uh, we, we, in our company, we do use LACP link, link aggregation a lot for HA uh, capabilities. We have. Uh, very often we have a, a, a switch stack of four or more s switches connected like a, uh, like a circle. And uh, we have a link aggregation over the stack. So uh, if you have bonds on, on, on the servers with link aggregation mode activated, one, it, it doesn't matter if one, one uh, port or one, one, one switch port is failing or one switch is failing you will still have uh, one gig throughput. And as long as, as, as everything's all right, we will have two gig throughput. And uh, yeah, and this is low cost solution. I mean, yeah, everybody is telling you we have to buy 10 gig switches or even 100 gig switches and stuff. But this is no, no, no way to go for, for mid-sized uh, companies. And on the other hand, we were in possession of quite, quite a bit, many servers or we are in possession of many servers that ran like three years or two years and then the customer want new hardware and we like to use uh, this, this hardware which is still good which still comes up to our needs uh, yeah in a good way okay the external uh, network LACP bond um, we have two neutron servers we're not changed to DVR. We're not planning to change to DVR. We're thinking about SDN, software defined networking. This is something which interests us a lot, and we're really planning to go there. And uh, yeah, what we have is um, well, I, I come later to the Newton service. Let's let's come to the uh, iSCSI. As we uh, experience quite a lot with uh, uh, other solutions, even with AppLogic and external storages, um, it does iSCSI a lot good to have its own network. And iSCSI really likes Jumbo frames. So if you have big workload on the packets, it's, it's ideal for iSCSI. So you should not mix up this, or you should not should mix up the iSCSI transport with a management network or, or anything else. This does, you see, one reason we built the, the, the environment like this is that at almost every point, you can scale horizontally. You don't need to scale vertically. That's, uh, so we prefer to just 
add more compute nodes or even uh, uh, yeah, add some, some more NICs inside of the servers and um, have a link aggregation of three or four or, or something than to, to buy new hardware or, or buy bigger servers or stuff like this. All right. Oh, I don't turn to the API. Hmm. <clears throat> In case you I'm not so work. Yep. Okay. What I described here is block A and block B. Well, it's uh, actually In the beginning, I, I had um, like the controllers, like, like you can read in, in almost every tutorial, every installation uh, advisory you, you find around the internet that you can uh, yeah, just have two servers, put all controllers on the two servers, and uh, that you, you can use containers on the servers and stuff like this. What you should not do, what I think you should not do is use virtualization because you lose a lot of, as I thought, bandwidth on your, on your interfaces, but uh, you can use containers. I don't really see the gain if you lacking file handles, add file handles. As long as you find a sensible uh, way to, to, to yeah, order things in, in groups and, and together, then it's, it's perfect like this. On the, on the block B, is a, it's, it's like a, a usual controller HA setup. You have a, a Nova there, a Keystone there, a Cinder there, a Glance there, a Heat there, and they're all active, active. Most of them use memcached. And uh, well, if one fails, okay, the other will do the job. Block A. Over there, we've got a Galera cluster, like three nodes, core room, and a master master replication. Um, it's too early. Okay, um, we've got a HA proxy, which we really use a lot, you will see later on. Um, you get uh, um, Horizon instances on all three. You've got RabbitMQ instance on all three. You've got Celometer, most of the stuff on all three. The uh, external agent is only allowed to run on one. So we have some cores and pacemaker configuration uh, added to it. So, and um, well, you have the neutron servers running on, the, on, 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 on this three as well. Uh, all these three are uh, managed by CoreSync pacemaker. And we have uh, locations for all the um, different types of services, so they have a, a priority on, on, on one uh, of the three and each on, on, on an, another node. What we do not use, what we started to use, but uh, we do not uh, load balance uh, um, the MySQL requests. This has one reason. We ran into problems with Keystone. Keystone kind of disliked the, the, the load balancing of, of, of my SQL request. I didn't find out why. I think it's going to be better with the next version, but uh, for this, I just have one virtual IP, and uh, uh, we only request one of the Galera servers uh, at a time. There's no issue with, with performance right now, um, but yeah, we will. We will have to work on it, and we will then have, uh, uh, yeah, MySQL balancing as well. Okay. Another thing which is uh, different from, from most environments, we have uh, three sets of uh, API proxies. This is HA proxies. The Swift you already saw. Um, then uh, we have, uh, like, if you remember the block A, there you have the, the internal proxies, HA proxies, where you can, uh, um, where all the internal requests come from. So uh, it's very really fast and it's re reliable. There are no security issues. And uh, um, yeah, okay. And then, yeah, as my founder asked me, I had to provide uh, the public, uh, well, public endpoints as well. Yeah, of course, customers want their public endpoints. First thing was, um, yeah, what, what, what do you do if you have to 
provide something you haven't got yet, and uh, where well, you look at your competitors, how, how do they do it, and then try to make it better. And I think one of our competitors, he was uh, like, you have to uh, provision a instance inside of your project, and then from this instance, you can have external API, API access. And, and I thought, no, stop, I don't, I, I don't really seem to want this. I don't want to be able to reach the uh, external API or any, 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 any endpoints only from the inside, because there has to be some, some ugly workaround uh, routing um, to get there. So what we use a lot in, 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 uh, at, at scale-up technologies is uh, OpenBSD firewall clusters. Well, this is um, perfect firewall clusters for, for, for uh, yeah, usual firewalling services, and uh, you can have this, uh, you can home many, many, you can home several, several customers on, on one cluster, or you can use it for your own environment. The only thing you will not get, you will not possibly get, is any certification. So if your customer asks for uh, yeah, security audits and certifications and stuff, yeah, you will end up with Cisco again. We, we have several Cisco clusters as well, but uh, for our own use, this is a perfect solution. Um, this, uh, I don't know if you're firm with, it's called PF, um, you can uh, have very sophisticated setups. You can uh, monitor uh, the frequency of requests and uh, everything, and, and just have your ACL uh, rule set set up like this to uh, to your needs. And uh, I thought, yeah, it might be a good idea to have a public uh, endpoint on a firewall cluster where I have uh, all the rule sets at hand and everything to to. Uh, observe the traffic coming in, observe the, the quality of traffic coming in, or the kind of traffic, or, and uh, yeah, here we go. Um, there's no problem to install HAProxy on OpenBSD. It's almost the same thing as with Linux. And uh, yeah, right. So we have, we ended up with, we have the Swift uh, API uh, uh, proxy where you can have a, uh, numerous uh, clients just coming with their kind of uh, requests, uh, like one likes the uh, URL that way, another this way, and you just do some rewrites and yeah, it works perfect. We've got this uh, firewall solution and we've got this in, uh, yeah, pretty normal inside solution, which is good HA setup. If one fails, there's no problem at all. And uh, yeah, works out works perfectly. So okay, um, I think we're running out a bit of time. Um, so we talked about the networking already. You already yeah, mentioned yeah. what we did there. Um, Maybe so the, I, I, can, I can say two or three sentences to the Newton server. It's just a really uh, yeah basic. It's a normal setup. Um, if you're not doing DVR, if you're not doing software-defined networking, if you're still with the old Newton stuff, you can have L3 on n number of, 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 of Newton servers. You can have um, a DHCP running from, from, from several servers. You cannot possibly have uh, a metadata service from, from more than one server. And you cannot possibly have load balance as a service from one or more servers. You can, you, you can just uh, uh, build an active passive setup with, with Corsing Pacemaker. Easily, you have to uh, do some scripting for the uh, load balance as a service solution because what it basically needs is that you need a query which, which just says, okay, all your uh, load balancer instances now run from this router ID, not any, anymore from that router ID, which is really simple. And then you have a reliable uh, networking solution as well. That's it. Okay, so what's left? Uh, we have this one slide um, um, left out. Um, so what we'll uh, do next is we'll uh, upgrade to Liberty probably next month. Um, and I guess soon thereafter, or at least not with such a large uh, time frame, to meet Haka. Um, we will need to do IPv6 at some point. I mean, uh, at least in Europe, we are out of IPv4 addresses, so we need to uh, do something there. Um, 
Uh, we did have a few uh, customers requesting uh, VDI uh, setups in the past, so we did some research the last couple of weeks uh, on how to leverage OpenStack running uh, virtual desktop infrastructures. Uh, and we figured out that we may need different compute nodes uh, specifically to run Windows there. Um, and uh, one idea for myself as founder of the company or like the big picture out there, at maybe one day we will have big OpenStack set up spread across all our data centers as like the base uh, foundation for any services that we provide. But that's certainly something in the future. So uh, if there's one or two questions, I guess we still have one or two minutes to, to answer those. Um, thank you for your attention. Yeah. Well, there's the question. I guess you should use a microphone so the others can hear what you're asking. Okay. Um, my question is about pacemaker. Um, you seem to use it a lot on the control plane. Um, have you used it in the, any VMs running on the cloud? And how well does that work with the multicast or do you not use multicast? No, you can use Unicast with, with, with uh, a causing a pacemaker. And I do this a lot. I don't, don't use multicast. multicast. And um, the other thing is you have to, um, um, before you have to uh, um, configure a port with Neutron, uh, that, that, that will hold the virtual IP. It will not work out of the box. Right. You have uh, to, to, yeah, you, you have to, to tell Neutron that you will, you, you are going to use a virtual IP, and this will, will, will be, uh, um, yeah, part of, of those two V nodes, for example. But then it works perfectly. Okay, thanks. Okay, so if there's no more. There's one question. Yeah, it's hard to see from up here. Are you are you running OpenStack at multiple locations? And if you are, how are you scaling it? At at this point, we only run it in one data center location. Um, it's still a small installation. Um, most of our customers still use other things, and we are trying to convince them every day to do yeah. something better with OpenStack. But this is certainly something we will do uh, at some point. Yeah, I have to. I have to explain. Maybe we started with uh, OpenStack like uh, end of 2014, uh, beginning of 2015, and now uh, we had about three or four months to production. Um, now we have more and more customers, and we have a lot of our own stuff now running on uh, uh, OpenStack. But we still got hosting service on AppLogic, and uh, still our own stuff has not migrated totally. And we are busy migrating all, everything over into, in, into our cluster. Um, do you uh, expect a downtime when you um, upgrade to uh, new versions? Or if you do, how, how do you deal with it? And it depends. It depends on what 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 up to, uh, what, what downtime. I mean, Rackspace now has this uh, sentence: 99.9% uh, .9 or 99% uh, API up, uptime, and that's that's a, that's a big number. Because if you're doing upgrades, you will, yeah we, you will run into API downtime possibly, uh, but this doesn't necessarily. Uh, uh, disrupt with the or uh, interfere with, with with the customer services. They will not be able to use, uh, the, not be able to manage their, their stuff for a while, but the, the availability is up. Which, which, I, I think what I meant was that what the VM would be running, the, you know, maybe they cannot put in new things on it, but um, but in general, the, their VM will be still running up, and um, you know, uh, that's what I meant. The downtime, yeah. So not the, I mean not talking about the infrastructure downtime or something like that. So, oh. so do, you, do, you, do you expect that there will be very little VM downtime you know, in that Not in, at all. during an upgrade? Not at all. Because, um, well, what, what I did two times already is uh, I'm, I've, I've uh, upgraded a test environment, which is almost the same. It's only one compute node. It's not several compute nodes. It's one compute node. But the rest is the same. And I did it twice. And I had some downtimes with the APIs, but I had n zero downtime with, with, with the uh, VNOS. 
Hi, uh, what was the Galera cluster version that you are using? I'm not sure. I can't tell you by heart. <laughs> no, the, the reason I ask is, I know you mentioned Keystone had difficulty uh, uh, yeah. load balancing with the Galera cluster, so I was just curious what version you're running. Okay. Yeah, it's, actually it's Pacona, and uh, um, I think it's Pacona X cluster. On uh, shoot, us, shoot us an email, we'll right. look it up. Okay. Yeah, right. it's no yeah, problem. Thanks. It must be 5.5 or 5.6 already. Was that on Ubuntu, Ubuntu or? Ubuntu uh, um, trusty. Okay, well, well ooh, another question. Sort of a question about the actual theme of this talk, uh, which is a small company bringing up OpenStack. Yeah. So kind of two quick questions. One is how big is the team that manages OpenStack? How many well, people? Well, so the total company, we're 10 people. And OpenStack is mainly Frank. Uh, I do some stuff. And then uh, our other engineers help out where they can, but it's mainly on one shoulder, really. That's At least like all the research and, and stuff. It, I mean, if you have a small company, you, you can't really uh, set apart one or two people to, to research all day. Well, it's, it, when it comes to devel development or, or uh, yeah, then, then, then it's me mainly. If it comes to maintenance or, or just you know, normal work, we have our technicians, we have five technicians, and they, they, they can do it as well. And then the other question is, uh, just roughly, how much does, did it cost um, to, for, for you know, the hardware, the infrastructure? Well, we had no cost for the hardware, almost no cost for the hardware. We bought four switches, which we, we have like a, a steady, uh, we have a steady stream of servers coming in for customers going out of service. So there's like, at least, uh, well, actually there's like too much hardware. We can't really use it all. So, <laughs> it's, yeah. um, so the only thing we really need to uh, we, buy is like networking gear. I guess that would, that would be the question. Um, so I, the iSCSI was all new network, probably. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks. Oh. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>